welcome back everyone uh, in this lecture uh, we will continue with uh, the definition of normal subgroups and we will see some characterization of uh, these subgroups so motivated from our earlier discussions uh, so let's recall what we did uh, so far so you start with the subgroup h which is a subgroup of g So then look at all this left cosets G modulo H. Okay, this is uh, given by G H where G and G. So these are all the set of all left cosets of G. So we have seen many examples for which this G modulo H naturally becomes a group okay with respect to the following uh, multiplication okay if we take g1 and g2 from capital g and then if we consider this cosets g1 and g2 h so then we actually saw that so this becomes group with respect to this new product rule okay so we want this uh, set of all lift cosets to, to have group structure with respect to this product okay so that was our motivation we saw many examples for which this happens so but uh, we also saw that uh, when it can naturally happen okay so for which subgroups this can happen that is what we want to address so our calculation indeed told us so if we take g1 h and g 2 h and then if we use uh, associativity and then uh, try to compute it what it is then we can see that uh, this is exactly equal to g 1 h g 2 h and then so this will become uh, what is on the left hand side g 1 g 2 h if one can switch this this right coset to left, co left coset h g 2 equal to g 2 h okay if we have that property then we can allow to switch this so this becomes g 1 g 2 h time h but it is easy to see h time h will be equal okay this is the step that is we are supposed to actually justify and that step is true if h g 2 equal to g 2 h. So, then we know that h times h okay, as a subset of g it will be h. So, that is something I asked you to verify. So, then this equality actually becomes so g 1 g 2. So, this comes for free. Okay. So, g 1 sorry g 1 g 2 times h. So, this comes for free since h times h is h. Okay. So, naturally the product of these two sets inside capital G, G1 h times G2 h that becomes equal to G1 G2 h if we have this property. Okay. The left coset corresponding to this G2 should be equal to the right coset corresponding to G2. Okay. So, this is something naturally arises, this condition naturally arises when we demand this G modulo H to have a group structure with respect to this multiplication. Okay? So, this is what somewhat motivates us to define what is called normal subgroups. So, let us see uh, the definition of normal subgroups and then we will later, uh, uh, so in a minute I will give you various characterization of uh, these normal subgroups. Okay, so first uh, let us define. So there are many ways to define because uh, there are various characterization of normal subgroups. So let us take something that uh, we have here. So let's rewrite this property that I, I we were demanding. So what it is? So we want to demand this right coset H G should be equal to left coset for all G in G. Okay. Because the, here the G1 and G2 they are chosen two random elements from capital G. 
So, that is why we have to demand this right coset is equal to left coset for all g and g. But if you really think about it, this is equivalent to saying that if you consider this conjugation okay, of this h by this g, so g inverse hg that must be equal to h for all g and g. Okay. So, this is what motivates us to define this normal subgroups. So, what is normal subgroup? So, here is the definition. So, let us start with H being a subgroup. Okay. So, then H is said to be normal if the following conditions satisfy. What it is? So, whenever you look at this conjugation g inverse h g. So, that should be equal to h for all g and g. So, this is one definition of normal subgroup. Okay. So, as I promised, so here is a theorem that characterizes all possible uh, definitions of normal subgroups. So, let us start with uh, fixing some notation. Let us take n to be a uh, subgroup of g. Okay. So, then we have the following statements. So, the following statements are all equivalent. So, first is the definition of a normal subgroup. So, that is if you take g n g inverse that should be equal to n for all g and g. So, this is what we took it as definition, but anyway this can be relaxed as follows. So, g n g inverse one can demand this to be just a subset of n for all g and g. So, these two statements are equivalent. The third statement, so if you take the left coset and the right coset, so they should be equal for all g and g. Okay. So, these three definitions are equivalent that is easy to see. So, here is the third uh, sorry the fourth definition. So, if you take this uh, g modulo n, so which is the set of all left cosets of g. So, that is uh, let us say g n where g running from capital G. So, this forms a group. Okay. This is a group with respect to this specific multiplication g 1 n times g 2 n is exactly equal to defined to be g 1 g 2 of n. Okay. So, note that in this multiplication already there is this well defined property. Okay. So, that also one can take it as uh, another definition of uh, this normal subgroup. Okay. So, if we take two different representatives let us say g 1 n equal to g 1 dash n and then g 2 n equal to g 2 n dash for some g 1 g 1 dash g 2 g 2 dash they are elements of g. So, then if you can consider this uh, this product okay, which you want to demand to be the right hand side g 1 g 2 capital N. So, those things should be equal. So, g 1 g 2 n should be equal to g 1 dash g 2 dash n. Okay. So, this should be true for all g 1 g 2 and g 1 dash g 2 dash. So, this you can take it to be the fifth definition. So, now the most important definition is the fourth one. Okay. So, this g modulo n is indeed a group with respect to this multiplication that we have defined. Okay. So, so then again if you think about it. So, the second condition indeed says if you conjugate capital N with any element of G. So, this G N G inverse. So, this is called conjugate of capital N with respect to the element G. So, that must be subset of N. Okay. That indeed says if you take any possible conjugate of capital N that should be inside capital N. 
but uh, capital n is conjugate to capital n by identity element so that says capital n is indeed union of all the conjugates of capital n okay so that you can take it to be this definition 6 so n is equal to union g n g inverse g n capital g and if we think about it more so this there is this inner auto inner inner automorphism of g so given by this uh, uh, element a uh, small g in g okay so you fix given capital g one can define this tau g from capital g to cap capital g given by x goes to g x g inverse so then one can verify that this tau g is indeed automorphism of g So, what is automorphism? It is an isomorphism from G to G. Okay? So, that is something uh, one can check immediately. So, then if you take uh, these tau G which are all elements of automorphism of G. So, that form a subgroup of this automorphism of G which is called inner automorphism of G. Okay? The inner automorphism of G which is uh, denoted by the set of all inner automorphism of G. Okay, this is by definition, so this is exactly equal to those tau G where G is coming from G. Okay, so this is a subgroup of automorphism of G. Okay, so automorphism of G we have already seen it is a group with respect to composition and this is actually a subgroup. So, this is something easy to verify, I will leave it to you to verify. Okay. So, if we take these inner automorphisms, then one can rewrite the definition as follows. So, you take tau g of capital N, this should be subset of capital N for all g and g. So, that means this subgroup capital N is invariant under all inner automorphism of g. Okay. So, here is another important uh, characterization which we call it 8. So, since this uh, G modulo N actually becomes actually a group, okay. so that actually gives you very natural uh, targeted group. Okay. So, in particularly we can have this what is called quotient map from G to G modulo N. Okay. So, where you can send any element G to the coset that corresponds to this uh, G n. Okay. So, later we will see actually the definition of homomorphism. Okay. So, in particularly it satisfy. So, pi of G 1 G 2 is equal to pi of G 1 times pi of G 2. So, that is the definition of group homomorphism. So, it is a map from g to g modulo n such that for any given g1 g2 from capital G we have pi of g1 g2 equal to pi of g1 times pi of g2. So, in particularly uh, one can verify once this g modulo n is a group with respect to this multiplication then this is indeed a group homomorphism. Okay. So, pi is a group homomorphism if G modulo n is a group. Okay. So, this is something we will verify later, but uh, this is not that hard to verify. So, now with respect to that group homomorphism, one can see that this n that can be realized as kernel of some group homomorphism. Okay. So, this is the another important characterization. So, there exist a uh, group homomorphism let us call it phi from g to g dash such that n is nothing but what is called kernel of phi. Okay. So, let me explain two things here. So, one is the group homomorphism. So, group homomorphism. So, I waited till this uh, normal subgroup because group homomorphisms are well connected with the normal subgroups. Okay. So, indeed uh, 
they in so normal subgroups naturally arise from group homomorphisms so what is group homomorphism so it is a map let's say phi from g to g dash so you have two groups capital g and capital g dash and phi is a map from g to g dash so satisfying the following property satisfying phi of g1 g2 should be exactly equal to phi of g1 times phi of g2 for all g1 g2 in capital g so that means if you take two elements from capital g and then take the product of those two elements in capital g and this phi maps the product to the product of respective elements in g dash okay so let's draw a picture and then see what happens so here you have g and then here you have g dash and then you have taken element g1 and g2 here and their product will lie somewhere here okay so then this g1 is mapped to phi of g1 here and then this g2 is mapped to phi of g2 here okay so then if you look at what happens to this product g1 g2 so then this product also should be mapped to the respective product here phi of g1 times phi of g2 so this product is happening in g dash okay so that is what phi does so phi of g1 g2 must be same as phi of g1 times phi of g2 so that is the demanding that we put for group homomorphism so group homomorphism is happening in the category of groups so it should preserve the group structure basically the morphism that actually preserves the group homo group structure is called group homomorphism so now what is kernel the kernel is so the kernel it is nothing but those elements inside g those are mapped to identity inside g dash okay so this is what kernel so kernel is actually a nice subgroup of this capital g which is mapped to identity with respect to that uh, group homomorphism okay so let me before uh, getting into the characterization of normal groups let me spend a uh, little time explaining uh, some properties of this group homomorphism and the kernel okay which is very important so the very first fact that i would like to actually prove the kernel is indeed normal subgroup inside g okay you have a group homomorphism let's say from g to g dash so this is group homomorphism between capital g to g dash so then you have the kernel so which is by definition this is those x in g such that which is mapped to this identity element in g dash okay so our claim is that it is a normal subgroup so normal subgroups are denoted by this symbol so tilted this triangle okay so it is actually a means normal subgroup okay let us see how one can prove this so you start with two elements and then see we already have this uh, characterizations for subgroups so if you take two elements x comma y inside this kernel phi so then kernel phi is a subgroup if and only if the the x y inverse so this is the claim should be inside the kernel phi so how do you verify this so let's see so if you compute phi of x y inverse then using the definition of this uh, Uh, this group homomorphism you can see that phi of x y inverse will become phi of x times phi of y inverse and it is not hard to verify that phi of y inverse must be same as phi of y inverse okay this is something i will leave it to to verify so that is because y into y inverse is identity then if you apply the morphism phi then phi of y into y inverse will be phi of identity and phi of identity must be identity of g dash okay so let us let me leave it to you to verify phi of 
identity of g map to identity of g dash because identity times identity should be identity. So, that will tell you that phi of identity should be map to identity and phi of y inverse should be map to inverse of phi of y. So, because of that you can see that phi of x y inverse is equal to phi of x times phi of y inverse which is same as phi of x times phi of y inverse. So, now you can see that this is exactly equal to. So, phi of x because it is coming from the kernel. So, phi of x must be identity. So, this is identity and this is again identity inverse. So, identity time identity inverse is just identity. So, that means x y inverse is inside the kernel of phi. Okay. So, this proves that kernel phi is indeed subgroup of g. So, this is a subgroup. So, now let us verify it is actually a normal subgroup. So, let us use one of the definition. Okay. The very first definition that I gave you normal if and only if whenever you take this conjugation. So, that should be equal to uh, this capital N. Okay. So, now let us consider this uh, element inside uh, inside this conjugation. Okay. Let us fix some g in g and then some x in kernel phi. So, then look at this conjugation g x g inverse what happens to this. So, because again uh, g x g inverse is just product of 3 elements in a group g and phi is a group homomorphism this can be rewritten as phi of x sorry phi of g times phi of x g inverse which can be rewritten again phi of g phi of x phi of g inverse. But phi of g inverse as I told before it is exactly phi of g phi of x phi of g inverse. So, now you can see that this phi of x is given to be identity because x is coming from kernel phi. So, because phi of x is identity g dash. So, you substitute there then you get phi of g x g inverse is equal to phi of g identity g dash phi of g inverse. But now this term identity times anything is itself. So, it is simplified as phi of g times phi of g inverse which is nothing but identity g dash. So, that means phi of g x g inverse we proved to be identity g dash. So, this means g x g inverse lies inside the kernel phi for all g in g and x in kernel phi. Okay. So, now what we want to prove? We want to prove that uh, g kernel phi g inverse must be equal to kernel phi. So, so far what we have proved? We have proved that g kernel phi g inverse is subset of kernel phi. Okay for all g in capital G. Okay, this is what we have proved. So, we want to prove the other way. So, let us see how one can prove the way. Let us start with kernel phi. So, you can write this as something like this. Okay. So, g inverse of g, g inverse times g because this is going to be just exactly equal to g inverse g kernel phi and then g inverse g. So, now this is just identity this is just identity. So, which is going to give you kernel phi here. Okay. So, now if you think about it. So, this g inverse of g kernel phi g inverse times g is going to be subset of g inverse kernel phi g from this equation because this is true for all g in g. So, so in particularly we have for this fix g. Okay, fix g in g. So, then we have this. So, now if you think about it. So, then what happens? So, this is again subset of kernel phi. Okay. Or one can actually okay, we wanted to prove the other way. 
so so what we wanted to prove so let me write the climb climb is kernel phi is subset of g kernel phi g inverse but it is same as saying that you can put minus here and then plus here for all g and g because the indexing g in g g inverse in g are same so in particularly if you take this uh, term okay you can see that uh, kernel of phi which is equal to this is subset of g inverse kernel phi g which is subset of kernel phi so this implies kernel phi is equal to g inverse kernel phi g okay so this is what we wanted to prove and this is now true for any fixed g in g so it should be true for all g in g so this is something very simple so this actually this discussion tells you that if you start with any group homomorphism then the kernel of that group homomorphism must be normal subgroup okay but uh, one of the characterization indeed says that any normal subgroup is indeed comes from kernel of some group homomorphism okay so this is how indeed normal subgroups arises okay so this is i want you to remember whenever you take normal subgroup so they corresponds to kernel of some group homomorphism okay for example from g to g dash so this uh, dictionary or the characterization of normal subgroup is very very important okay if in practice if you are interested in proving something is actually a normal subgroup then i would recommend okay try to find a group homomorphism for which it becomes kernel okay so it's very very important but again abstractly speaking once you have some normal subgroups so, so we will see in a minute in any abelian group any subgroup will be a normal subgroup so because of that you can produce lots of lots of interesting quotients so these uh, g modulo n they are called quotient subgroups sorry quotient groups or factor groups so you will be able to produce many interesting family of uh, factor groups or quotient groups again both way it's very very interesting okay so i would actually indeed uh, prove uh, one or two of this uh, characterizations and then i will leave it to you to check uh, remaining so maybe i will uh, try to prove uh, this 1 2 3 sorry 1 2 4 they are all equivalent okay so once i am done with that uh, then you can see that okay phi is somewhat hidden in proving 4 is indeed uh, true equivalent to the definition of normal subgroup and then 6 and 7 they are indeed definitions okay 8 is actually comes for free once you prove that uh, g modulo n is a group for norm, uh, for normal subgroup n because the converse of 8 we already verified kernel of any group homomorphism must be normal okay so let me just uh, spend one or two minutes in explaining the characterization so let us start with the first definition okay so the very first definition tells so g n g inverse equal to n for all g and g so we want to say that this is equal to g n g inverse is subset of n for all g and g and then the third thing g n is same as n g for all g and g okay so let's prove one implies two so one implies two is obvious because once they are equal then obviously the subset will be uh, true okay so this is indeed verified immediately so now what's about 2 implies 3 so for 2 implies 3 let's observe the following okay so 1 if and only if 3 is obvious 1 if and only if 3 so this is obvious because if we rewrite gn equal to ng so then if and only if g n g inverse becomes capital n and this is true for all g and g and this is true for all g and g 
so this is indeed very obvious statement so now because of that we will just prove that okay 2 implies 3 and then uh, 3 implies 1 the uh, 3 implies 1 is obvious okay so we'll just uh, uh, prove that 2 implies 3 or 2 implies 1 or yeah 1 implies 2 is obvious okay so how do you prove 2 implies 1 so as we did before you consider g inverse n g okay and then apply g and g inverse so note that this is subset of n so this must be subset of g n g inverse okay because g inverse n g by definition is subset of n so again fix g n g not a problem so g inverse n g must be subset of n so if you apply g g inverse conjugate again then g g inverse n g g inverse sub, must be subset of g n g inverse but note that this is exactly equal to g g inverse capital N g g inverse so this grouping we are able to do because we have associative law so then this becomes exactly identity times ident n times identity which is n okay so this simply says that n is subset of g n g inverse okay we have the other way g n g inverse is subset of n now we proved that n is subset of g n g inverse that proves that n equal to g n g inverse okay so this simply proves that all these three statements are equivalent so now using this we want to actually verify the fourth statement which is g modulo n is actually a group with respect to this product okay for that we have to verify few things first is this product that is given here or the map which is from g modulo n cross g modulo n to g modulo n is actually a well defined map so that is what part of this phi okay once you verify it is well defined then you have to verify with respect to this multiplication g modulo n is indeed becomes a group for that you have to identify the identity element and uh, given any element the inverse and so on but those things are somewhat easy why because the only verification that you are indeed to do is this uh, well defined as if you take two cosets representatives like this and then if you multiply them you have to verify they are same g1 g2 capital n should be g1 g2 inverse sorry g1 dash times n so this is what we have to verify so given this we have to verify the product the corresponding product must be same as the corresponding product so note that so g1 n okay this is equivalent to what so this is equivalent to g1 dash inverse g1 is in n similarly this is equivalent to g2 dash inverse g2 in capital n recall x capital n equal to y capital n if and only if y inverse x is in capital n so this is something we have already proved two left course sets are equal if and only if y inverse x equal inside n so now using this you can see that so this is equivalent to g1 dash g2 dash inverse g1 g2 is being in n but what is this this is exactly equal to g2 dash inverse g1 dash inverse g1 and then g2 okay so now uh, so let's do the computation so we want to prove uh, the product that we have defined on the on the coset must be actually same so uh, so let's compute this so this is indeed okay so we have to verify 
So, since n is normal inside G, we already know that if we take this element, okay, let us let us take uh, for example, this element G 1 dash inverse G 1. Okay. So, this G 1 dash inverse G 1, this is an element in capital N. So, now if you conjugate with uh, G 2 inverse, so G 2 dash inverse G 1 dash inverse G 1 and then G 2 dash. If you conjugate with G 2 dash, this is again should be N. Okay. So, so N being normal implies this. So, now from this how do you get this element? So, that is what we have to see. So, this is going to be now you can you can rewrite. So, G 2 dash inverse G 1 dash inverse G 1 and then you write G 2 dash G 2 dash inverse G 2. Okay. So, this is going to be this call this is x. So, this is x times this y. Okay. So, x times y. So, where x is this, this term and y is this term. So, this g2 dash inverse time g2, it is already given to be element in capital N because these two are same. So, that tells that this x y is indeed element of capital N because x is in capital N and y is in capital N. So, that means the product x y is in capital N, but which is same as g 2 dash inverse g 1 dash inverse g 1. So, these two gets cancelled and g 2. So, which is what there is here. Okay. So, this is element of capital N. So, these two cosets being equal same as saying that these element G 2 dash inverse G 1 dash inverse times G 1 G 2 is an element in capital N. Okay. So, that means the product that we have defined G 1 N times G 2 N is defined to be G 1 G 2 N is indeed well defined product. So, this is well defined Okay. So, now I will leave it to you to check if you take identity times n which is n is the identity element. So, this is the identity element of this G modulo n. Okay. So, this is something I will leave it to you to verify and then if you take any G n inverse. So, that is exactly G inverse capital N. So, this is going to be the inverse of G n inside your G modulo n. Okay. And associativity comes for free from associativity comes for free from the associativity of capital G and well defined as of product. Okay. So, associativity is indeed uh, comes for free from the well definers of the product and identity is nothing but this coset corresponding to the identity element of capital G is the identity inside G modulo n and then the inverse of each this coset is nothing but G inverse capital N. So, these things actually verifies all the group laws of uh, this G modulo n with respect to this product. So, that makes this G modulo n is a group. Okay. So, now if this G modulo n is a group, so then it is easy to verify the quotient map that you have from G to G modulo n sending G to G capital N is in this a group homomorphism. So, this is a group homomorphism. So, this is called quotient map. So, this is called quotient map or quotient homomorphism and kernel of this map is exactly equal to capital N. 
So, this is something one can check immediately. Okay. So, the kernel is exactly the capital. So, in particularly, so n is normal that implies n is uh, kernel of this quotient homomorphism. And uh, if you go back to the definition, you can see that any uh, kernel of any homomorphism is indeed uh, normal subgroup that is something we verified. So, that means we proved that 4 implies 8 and 8 implies 1. So, that completes the cycle. So, that proves all these characterizations are all equivalent. Okay. The de definition 6 and 7 they are immediate from the definition okay. and 5 we verified on the way because we need to verify that the product that we have defined is indeed well defined product okay. and that makes this G modulo n is a group and that makes that uh, uh, this uh, n is a kernel of this quotient map. Okay. To complete the cycle we verified that uh, kernel of any group homomorphism, group homomorphism must be actually normal subgroup. So, this completes all the characterizations. Okay. So, I will stop here and then uh, we will actually see some examples. So, later using these characterizations. Uh, uh, in the next class and we also see some uh, examples of factor groups or quotient groups. Thank you, I will stop here.